Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I never know if, uh, if it's on or not. But uh, first of all, whenever I feel down about being involved in politics, I always think about people who have stood up for me. And uh, one of the first names that always comes to my mind is David Hale. Thank you, brother. <laughs> um, and the Rockford Tea Party. And I also want to say, Mickey, that is an, uh, those, those are some awesome uh, credentials that you have. I wish that the President of the United States had half of your credentials <laughs> and half of your sincerity. So God bless you, brother. And let me tell you, if I was uh, a resident of Rockford, I would vote. You'd have my vote for sure. <laughs> so uh, I, I think um, yeah, yeah, everybody in Rockford is very, very lucky to have a candidate like you for running for uh, school board. So God bless you. Um, I, as David mentioned, I, I, I ran for Illinois Comptroller as a Republican, and. Uh, I, I remember, one of the things I remember about running for comptroller was I would go to all the Republican Party meetings and, um, oh by the way, before I forget, I just want to say another difference, or one, one of the, the key uh, differences between the Communist Manifesto and the Declaration of Independence is that uh, the Communist Manifesto is responsible for countless millions of innocent deaths and the Declaration of Independence is, is responsible for countless millions of people being free. Uh, so that, that's the main difference <coughs> yeah, that I see. But, um, the, um, the, the main thing that I remember when I was running for comptroller was I would go to speak to the Republican Party uh, different meetings around the state of Illinois and they would say, you have two minutes <laughs> to talk about your, you know, why you're running for Illinois comptroller. And I thought to myself, that, you know, that's interesting. They're, they're going to give me two minutes to talk about how I, I intend to, you know, open the books, you know, expose the insider deals, reform state government, balance the budget. <laughs> when it took them 20 years to, you know, to get us in this mess to begin with, you know what I mean? And uh, and I would come, you know, to when I when I came to speak to the Rockford Tea Party, David handed me the microphone and said, you know, just tell us why you're running for control. He didn't put any time limit on it, you know. Uh, so I, I really appreciate that. And after, um, when I was running for comptroller, I wrote a blog called The Kelly Truth Squad uh, because one of my opponents for comptroller, uh, basically the, it seemed like the whole reason he was in the race was to spread lies and smears and, and gossip and rumors and innuendo about me. And only half of what he was saying was actually true. <laughs> I just want to say that right now. Okay? <laughs> but, uh, um, but, I started writing this um, this blog, The Truth Squad, and apparently this uh, one of my Facebook friends or something must work for the Washington Times because after the campaign was over, uh, they contacted me and asked if I wanted to write the Tea Party report. And I thought, you know something? Considering the fact that the only support that I had in my campaign for Comptroller came from the Tea Party, um, I would definitely love to write the Tea Party report and, and defend the Tea Party. So, uh, so it's been my honor to do that since the campaign, and uh, you can uh, definitely access that anytime you want uh, if you go to kellytruthsquad.com, and I'll hand you uh, a flyer with uh, all the information on it if you want to take a look at that at some point. But, um, you know, we've really, if you think about it, there's been a lot said in the national media for the last couple of days about hateful rhetoric in America. And I can tell you right now, that the people who have received, who have been on the receiving end of the hateful rhetoric in America is the Tea Parties. Okay? Uh, Harry Reid, uh, actually it was just on one of the Sunday shows, that's why I was so surprised to see that you were all here. Uh, he said that after the election the Tea Party was just going to go away. So, I, you know, I, I was, I'm really surprised that, that you're even here, right, <laughs> considering that. But, but at the same time, he did say, Senator Harry Reid did say, that the Tea Party would go away after the financial crisis was over. So I guess as long as uh, as long as we have the Democrats in, in Springfield that we have, and as long as we have the Democrats in the White House and in the Congress that we have, I guess the Tea Party will never go away. You know, so I you know I guess that explains it. But um, I, I have been pretty active, I guess you could say, in uh, in politics since uh, I lost for Illinois Comptroller. I was one of the official objectors to uh, Rahm Emanuel's petitions. Rahm Emanuel, uh, as you may or may not know, is a, uh, a Democrat candidate for mayor of the city of Chicago. There's only one problem. He doesn't fulfill the residency requirement to be a candidate for mayor of the city of Chicago. 
And um, I know that the people in the Tea Party, contrary to what the media likes to say, are very fair-minded people, okay? Fair-minded people who love freedom and want to hear about the issues, and they don't care about personalities. They're willing to give anybody a chance. I guess I'm a good a prime example of that. Um, but, um, but the truth of the matter is that every candidate that runs for public office has to fulfill certain requirements. And that's, uh, you have to have uh, a certain number of signatures. Anyone who's ever worked for public office knows this. You have to have them notarized. You have to have the pages numbered correctly. They have to be bound correctly, okay? And, and to be a candidate for mayor of the city of Chicago, the, not the least of which, you have to be a resident of the city of Chicago, okay? And the fact of the matter is that the Chicago Board of Election Fraud, I call it now, uh, they routinely throw candidates off the ballot. Candidates like me, you know, reform candidates, conservative candidates, off the ballot for any one, uh, missing any one of these little rules or regulations, okay? But yet, when, when I challenge Ron Emanuel's petitions on the basis of residency, clearly, we all know he's been in Washington for the last year, okay? Clearly, we all should know by now that he rented out his house, legally forfeiting his legal residency status of the city of Chicago, okay? This, uh, if, if, this were, if, I were, if this were my campaign for, for mayor, or any of your campaign for mayor, and you did not fulfill the residency requirement, you would be thrown off the ballot, no questions asked. How do I know this? Because the only Republican candidate for mayor of the city of Chicago, the only one, Tom Hansen, who I worked for and circulated petitions for, was thrown off the ballot, okay? And not because he didn't have a number of signatures, trust me, I know. Not because they weren't notarized correctly, not because they weren't bound, and not because he wasn't a legal resident, but because the Chicago Board of Election Fraud said that they lost his paperwork. <laughs> you think I'm making this up? Go, go to YouTube, uh, search Kelly Truth Squad, um, or, um, and, uh, or William J. Kelly sings karaoke, something like that. I'm not quite sure what. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, go to that and search uh, and, and scroll down and watch the uh, interview with Tom Hansen, and, and you'll see you'll see that what I'm telling you the truth because I videotaped the hearing where this where he, his name was removed from the ballot. Okay, Tom Hansen was also a Republican candidate for Congress against Ron Emanuel. So you put two and two together. Um, this is the same Ron Emanuel who said, never let a crisis go to waste. This is one of the most cynical phrases, I think, in the history of American politics. And you have seen it play out in the last 48 hours in, what, uh, in how the media has tried to demonize the, the Tea Party with this tragedy down in, in Arizona. And it is absolutely shameful. And what, and what really sh embarrasses me and makes me feel even more ashamed uh, to be from Chicago or Illinois, as if I, you know, as if that's even possible at this point, mm -hmm. is that our senior senator, Dick Durbin, one of the truly, truly most uh, partisan and bitterly partisan politicians in the, the U.S. Senate today, um, jumped on this, jumped on this with both, you know, with both hands, both feet, okay, and, and tried to pin this squarely on the Tea Party. Here is a guy who has a mutual friend with Ron Emanuel, a guy who has a mutual friend with Barack Obama named Bill Ayers. Has anyone ever heard of the name Bill Ayers? Okay, a guy who truly has used uh, inflammatory uh, political rhetoric, a guy who truly has, uh, has advocated and carried out uh, um, uh, acts of political violence. Okay, is this the height of hypocrisy? For, for, for Senator Dick Durbin to, uh, to you know, not, not, to, uh, not to try to somehow uh, say that Bill Ayers is, is, is despicable or responsible for, for political uh, hatred or violence, but to say that Sarah Palin and the Tea Party is, when there's, when there's not a shred of, of connection between, what, uh, between this, uh, this gunman in Arizona and, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the Tea Party. So, um, so I think that we need to stand up for ourselves, we need to stand up for each other. Um, I'm more than happy to do that with whatever time, you know, I have left on, on planet Earth. 
Um, you know, I think that we, in a lot of ways, are the most fair, okay? We're here because we love our country. We're here because we love freedom. That's why we're here, okay? I've spoken to every Tea Party group in the state of Illinois uh, from, for, you know, since I think maybe the very first Tea Party uh, meeting that was ever held. And I can tell you, I've never come across a single person that I didn't think was, was sincere and from the heart. And, um, and I don't remember a single member of the Tea Party trying to use the, uh, uh, the, the, the Fort Hood shooting, uh, Major Hassan. Here, here's a guy who had a PhD in psychology, okay? He was responsible for the murder of 12 American servicemen and women and, the, uh, and injuring 31 some others, okay? And, and the media did everything possible to say that he was just an individual, he did not represent a single uh, religion or group, and that we should not jump to any conclusions. They, from the word go, jumped out of the box to say to defend uh, uh, Major Hassan. And, and look at the difference between the way they treated uh, Major Hassan for hood shootings and the way they treated the, the shootings in our, in, uh, down in uh, Arizona. Okay, they, they, right out of the box, uh, our Senator Dick Durbin uh, was saying that it was the Tea Party. Okay, I think Dick Durbin owes the Tea Party an apology. Um, hello, my name is Mickey Simmons and I'm running for candidate for uh, school board member and District 205 Subdistrict C, okay? Um, I'm sorry here, I kind of went through my speech to shorten it, so. <laughs> Um, what I'd like to uh, do is tonight, I'd like to introduce myself to you, okay? Um, as a community member, I feel I have the need to quit being just a spectator, and I feel the need to give back to our children's education, and I feel the need to be a positive part of fixing what ails our school districts. Our founders of Winnebago County and the Rockford area were sacrificial in their giving of time, money, effort, skills, their diverseness, and planning so that our community would rise to the top of our nation's Midwest region. And they successfully gave their all. And we not only need to realize what is currently at stake, but we also need to replenish what we have been given so that our children can become the productive citizens of their time. I accept nothing less than accountability and involvement from the school board, the administration, the teachers, the parents, the children, and the community at large and I would hope that you would do the same. Um, sorry, just a second. I would like to introduce you to some of my objectives that I would hold as a board member when I'm honored to be elected. And in particular, the following six items are the things I believe to be important and achievable with some work and dedication. One, focusing on putting the students first. Two, solving the financial crisis that we're in. Three, providing a safe and nurtured environment conductive to learning um, for our children. Four, raising performance level all students and increase the graduation rates. Five, uh, improving communication between the schools and the families. And six, improving communication, I'm sorry, community confidence in our schools. Um, although it sounds fairly difficult, I truly believe that all these are very real, realistic, accomplishable, and mutually desired goals, and I also believe that we can reach these in a short period of time with lots of hard work and dedication. You are no doubt asking yourself, what makes Mickey Simmons uh, any different once he's elected? And you know, why would he act any different from any of the rest of the politicians of this day? For starters, I'm not a career politician, okay? And I do not, not aspire to fortune or fame. I have never run for office before. I'm just a blue collar working class guy, a uh, parent of three school age children who wants to represent an order in this order, the children first, parents, the taxpayers, and the community. My wife and I uh, have three children. I am a native Rockford area, uh, native Rockfordian uh, for all my life. I am a father and a husband and a businessman. I have lived in Rockford for 40 years. I have uh, resided at my current address in Subdistrict C for over 16 years. I'm, I attended Harlem High School. I've been married for over 17 years. Thank you, Benny, for staying with me there. Uh, uh, with 
three school age children. I have been a foster parent to 23 children. I have served as a house parent in an orphanage. I studied accounting, marketing, business and management at Rockford Business College. I currently um, assistant coach for the fifth and sixth grade boys basketball team. I am a proud team, well, I, I was a proud teamster, but I'm currently on honorable withdrawal and I am self-employed currently. Uh, my wife is a member of Ask Me, okay, which is the estate uh, union employee, okay, member. Uh, some other things uh, I'd like to say, but because of time I'm going to shorten it. Uh, my question to you today, okay, is are, are we willing to do, this, do the same for our children and their children as our founding fathers of this community? <coughs> Or are we going to be part of the failure? I know that all the people in this school district want this to be the best, or want this school district to be the best for our children and our community and its future. And I want to help make this district be the best. So when you go to the polls on Tuesday, I ask you one thing. Remember, my name is Mickey Simmons, subdistrict tree. I think I'm candidate number three on the ballot and I ask you for your support <coughs> and together we can make the Rockford School District 205 a great place again. And I'm counting on you and I would appreciate your vote April 5th. And if you want to look any information up on me, I have a website, I'm on Facebook, uh, www.makeysimmons.com is my uh, thing. You can look up me up at citizensforsimmons.com or just my name, Mickey Simmons, on Facebook. And I appreciate your time very much. Thank you, David. Thanks. Thank you, David. I appreciate the opportunity, and I'm kind of looking forward to it as well, because I'm always interested in the declaration. Uh, folks, anybody in this audience from Ward 1? Any jokes? Well, uh, for those of you, um, my pitch tonight is basically this. Yeah, help me if you can, if, you, if you're available to help. Bottom line is to, uh, all the candidates are good candidates. They're going to come before you and tell you about their uh, virtues, their core values, and the like. But the key I want you to investigate, for those of you who are in Ward 1 and others, is, and those of you who want to help, what life experiences, what skills do you bring to the table that demonstrate you have the capability to deal with the issues and uh, by the way, has anybody heard of Senate Bill 4333, the property tax uh, fair cash value bill that was passed in August? It's going to change our lives significantly because the assessed valuation of your homes is going to be, it's going to be required that uh, short sales and foreclosure sales, that means your properties in this next general assessment are going to be readjusted. And what's that going to do? It's probably going to make the crisis we have even more significant because as you were talking about, the schools depend on 60% of their budget for, uh, based on property taxes. And if, they, and if you aren't articulate, knowledgeable, well-based in Illinois statutes dealing with codes uh, that uh, address the Department of Revenue and your assessment, you're in big trouble. So who am I? I came here in 89 as an Air Force officer um, to do the ethical uh, and the governance problems associated with uh, Sunstrain Corporation. We collected over $200 million in fines, and we put them through 805 management corrective actions. I was dealing on a daily basis with the Department of Justice uh, and the Defense Department to deal with the, the largest fine contractor in the history of, of uh, the United States at that particular time. So I brought in uh, uh, a change of governance and ethics uh, that was unheralded, and the commander of the, the two-star general said, you did something nobody else had done and did it with a, 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 an air so that it would become the model in the future. Uh, that was my ethical uh, presentation to uh, uh, the mayor when he interviewed me for this interim position. Of course, that went to another individual. But the key is uh, that was the ethics side. From a visionary side, uh, I had to deal with uh, over 65, probably $2 billion worth of command and control programs uh, they were slated to go to Military Airlift Command, now Air Mobility Command. And they were two, three years behind, and in a three-year period I managed to put those, con uh, those programs uh, on schedule and inside of cost. So I've kind of looked at the visionary problem and dealt with those problems. I'm also the president for the last 10 years 
of the Military Officers Association here in the Northern Illinois, and we've uh, donated thousands of dollars and raised money for uh, uh, for Memorial Hall. And last, I've oversaw seeing the operation of 57 airplanes out of Military Airlift Command wing at Charleston Air Force Base. So I know how to run an organization. The bottom line is, do you have the visionary, the operational skills, and the and the ethical skills to be an alderman to listen to people and forward that and be a good representative? I hope. That gives you a snap, uh, that kind of a capsule view of my capabilities. Uh, John Danielson, uh, adjunct instructor at Rock Valley College in political science and uh, full time uh, treasurer for the city of Oak Park. I'm used to speaking to uh, classrooms of students who are sometimes half asleep. So, uh, <laughs> But anyway, maybe that's my fault. We'll see. At any rate, thank you for inviting me. I really do appreciate this opportunity. Um, I want to thank Dave uh, particularly, but all of you really thank you for participating in this kind of an activity. Um, it shows your sense of citizenship and your love of this country, and believe me, as we all know, that's uh, something we need a lot more of. Um, it's, it's interesting, uh, as I mentioned, to talk about the Declaration of Independence. I want to talk a little bit, just a little bit of history about it, but then go more uh, into the political theory, if you will, of what's behind the Declaration. We've all seen it, obviously, a number of times, and we all celebrated it at various times, and certainly on the 4th of July. But there's a whole lot there in many respects more than meets the eye. Um, the Declaration of Independence um, should be remembered. Of course, we celebrate July 4, 1776, and that's when the Declaration of Independence was voted on and passed. But actually, some of you probably know, independence was actually voted on July 2nd by the Continental Congress. Independence was voted on July 2nd. July 4th, the Declaration of Independence was, was passed, and basically it explains why we're declaring independence, okay? Um, and it also explains, in some respects, the relationship between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. I often like to ask in class, what's more important? Declaration of Independence or the Constitution? Actually, it's kind of a trick question. They're co-equals, okay, and they serve, in a sense, different functions. The Declaration of Independence lays out what government's supposed to do. What are the goals of government? Okay, that's what the Declaration lays out, among other things. Um, it also um, sets forth those goals, as I mentioned. It provides the the, the goals or the ends of what government's supposed to do, and the Constitution is that framework or uh, that tries to achieve those goals that are laid out in the Declaration of Independence. Now, in order to understand the Declaration of Independence, I think, in, in, in a deeper sense, we kind of have to understand some of the political theory that comes, uh, uh, that comes before it and behind it. As you may know, Thomas Jefferson um, wrote the Declaration of Independence. He was part of, a, part of a committee of five, and the primary members of that committee were Jefferson, Adams, <coughs> and, um, um, who am I forgetting? Um, at any rate, it, it's, it's Ben Franklin. Anyway, Jefferson's the primary author. Have any of you seen the Adams series that was on HBO series here a couple of years ago? If you haven't seen it, highly recommend it. There's, it has a few flaws, but ultimately it's really <coughs> very good. And, it, and the second part in particular gives you a bit of a feel for the wrangling and the political debate and all that went with um, issuing the Declaration of Independence. And as, as I say, if you get a chance, you can rent it. It's, the prices come down if you want to buy it. Um, I actually show the second part of that uh, in class uh, for one period because I think it's, it's worth seeing and it brings that sense or that feel of what the times were, but, but really the struggle that went on as well. And it reminds us, really, what an important figure John Adams was, too. We've kind of forgotten that. He's kind of, in some ways, along with some others, kind of one of the forgotten founders, if you will. But it's worth looking at. But at any rate, to start with, if you're going to understand the Declaration, we have to understand some theoretical concepts. And one of those is something called a state of nature. What's that? Well, a state of nature, according to people like Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and others, is a state where there's, imagine if there's no government, 
All right, no government. What, in other words, they asked, what state is man naturally in? And they argued, and of course, obviously, there are people who disagree, but they argued that man's natural state is a state where there's no government, a state of nature, and that government is not natural to man and is a human construct. All right? Now, that's directly opposite of what the ancients thought and others think, but that's nonetheless the theory that we see behind the Declaration. So let's talk about this state of nature just a little bit. Um, a state of nature is a place, as I mentioned, where there's no government. Um, that sounds kind of almost intriguing, doesn't it, in some ways? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe even inviting. But is it really? Uh, in a state of nature, it's, it's what, who rules in a state of nature? The strong, the biggest, baddest person, so to speak, all right? Um, and that's fine, and the biggest, baddest person can do whatever he wants, until when? Bigger. Or he goes to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that's true, all right? Everybody's got to sleep at some point. Now, in the state of nature, because there is no government, you know, there's no, there's no sheriff, there's no state legislature, there's nothing, we have the natural right to do whatever we want, anything. We have the natural right in the state of nature to do whatever we want. We can be judge, jury, and executioner. If somebody attacks us, we have the absolute right to defend ourselves and kill them if we want, or if we can. Okay? So in the state of nature, uh, we have absolute freedom in a sense, and we have the right to do whatever we want to the extent that we can enforce it. Okay? That's a very big caveat. Can you enforce it? Can you do it? Now, in a state of nature, as I said, you have the right to be judge, jury, and executioner. You can do whatever you want. Now, can I point to a certain period of time and say the state of nature existed here in, you know, 1372 someplace? No. In some sense, it's a theoretical construct, but a useful one. And one that if we think about, we can look around the world even today and see examples of where state of nature exists. Um, we can all think of places like Somalia, others where there's really no government and where the strongest rules. Okay, that's not hard to think of. What happens even in society when it breaks down and there's a riot? You return, in a sense, to a state of nature. If you're walking in a dark alley and you're attacked, I guarantee you, you return to a state of nature, at least for that instance. So a state of nature is something that exists in terms of how we look at man's uh, natural state, but we can see in some ways that that natural state comes in and out of existence at times depending on circumstances. Another way to understand the state of nature is think of foreign relations, relations between countries. We really truly are in many respects in a state of nature vis-a-vis -vis other countries and other powers. It's where, the, it's where the powerful, so to speak, carry. Okay, regardless of what you know, we might expect the UN and other organizations to do. The reality is, we are still in many ways in a state of nature vis-a-vis -vis our country and other countries. And that's a good way to start to think about foreign policy. As I mentioned, <coughs> in a state of nature, you have, in a sense, a right to do anything that you want to do. But this state of nature becomes, as Thomas Hobbes called it, an unendurable state. It's this place where all these rights exist, but you're lucky if you can exercise them, right? Because that bigger, badder person's going to come along and take away whatever it is you have. And in the state of nature, basically your <coughs> preoccupation is simply with existence. Okay? It's, it's, this is not a, a place where you're going to be able to build much or do much or grow much. You're basically simply trying to stay alive on a day-to-day -day <laughs> basis. Let me read you what Thomas Hobbes <coughs> wrote about a state of nature. It's kind of interesting, and there's a rather famous sentence at the end. He says, Whatsoever, therefore, is consequent to a time of war, where every man is enemy to every other man, in other words, the war of all against all, the same is consequent to the time wherein men live without other security than what their own strength and their own invention shall furnish them with all. In such condition, there is no place of industry. There's no industry. There's no business. You're simply trying to stay alive. Because the fruit thereof is uncertain. 
and consequently no culture of the earth. You're not going to have people make, having big farms and so forth. This is, this is in a state of nature, you're scratching to stay alive. No navigation, nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving, and removing such things as, as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And life, and the life of man, is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Doesn't sound like a place we all want to be, does it? State of danger. So then the question becomes, if this is an unendurable state, where do, how do we get out of this? Okay, well, the answer simply is this, again from Hobbes and Locke, and that is we form a compact of every person with every other person, and we consent to form something called civil society. But there's a price for that, too. You have to be willing to surrender most, not all, most of your natural rights. Okay? You have to surrender your power to be judge, jury, and executioner. You surrender that up to a civil authority, and you allow that civil authority to be judge, jury, and executioner. But there's certain things and certain rights that we cannot surrender, that we retain from a state of nature. Okay? Does that make sense? That's the quick overview of the state of nature. And that gets us to the Declaration of Independence. By the way, do, did any of you have the opportunity to, um, I forgot to ask you this, uh, copy off <coughs> what was sent out on, uh, if you want to take some of these, I have some copies here to the Declaration, just the part that I'm going to talk about, and you can kind of pass those around and follow along. <coughs> All right. So we've discovered that a state of nature is not a very nice place. Even though we have the right to do anything we please, and in a sense we have perfect freedom in a state of nature, but it's a state that's unendurable. A state that we, in order, in, ironically, to secure our basic rights, we have to leave a place, in a sense, where you have the right to do anything, because those rights are very unsecure. <coughs> now, as I mentioned, in order to get out of that state of nature, man has to have a compact or agree with every other person that we're going to form civil society. That's a unanimous agreement. Sounds kind of strange, but it is. And if you think about it for a moment, go back to our own founding. What happened after the Revolutionary War? And we won. The people who didn't agree, or were Tories, or who were supported the British, what did they do? They left. That's how they voted in some sense. The people who stayed, if you will, gave their tacit consent, if you will, and consented, so to speak, to, um, uh, to live in this civil society. And as I say, so you consent to come out of a state of nature, and you consent away most, but not all of your natural rights, and we're going to investigate that a little bit more. Uh, you'll see in the Declaration of Independence it talks about consent of the governed. I'll talk about this a little bit more. But consent in the Declaration, surprisingly enough, from a theoretical standpoint, has nothing to do with voting. It has to do with consenting to leave a state of nature and consenting most, certainly not all, of your natural rights up to that, up to that authority. All right, let's go to turn to the Declaration. <coughs> Let me read you just the, the, first, the first bit here. There's the De Declaration of Independence. It's the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States. Okay, that's important, Unan unanimity, unanimous. The founders understood that there was a requirement for unanimity that all 13 states had to come along for a couple of reasons. One was their chances of success weren't real good to start with. And if you had half of them <coughs> saying, no, we're not going to do this, and the other half saying, we will, what are the odds of going up against, at that time, the greatest military power on earth and winning? 
I mean, it was it was a whole lot of luck to start with. So if it wasn't unanimous, the odds of the odds of winning here were diminished considerably. Um, <clears throat> also, it speaks to when the, in a sense, when the union was formed at, the, at this point in time, 1776. If we think of, for example, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, what does he say? Uh, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Four score and seven years, 87 years, subtracted from 1863, you arrive at 1776. Not at the Constitutional Convention, not when the Articles of Confederation, for example, were instituted, but at 1776. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so he goes on to say, when in the course of human events, I like to tell my students, notice it says human events and not animal rights, human <laughs> events. <laughs> when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. So remember we declared independence on July 2nd. Now we're telling the world, not just this country, but the world, why? And something else we should keep in mind, too, is that the issuing of the Declaration of Independence and bringing forth this new nation, as Lincoln said, was the first time in human history that a country was founded not by force or accident, but on an idea. And that idea, we'll get to in a little bit, primarily is that all men are created equal. We'll see what that means. So that's something really unique. The American system and the American Revolution took political wisdom that had existed for 2,000 years and literally stood it on its head by saying that the rights and the power come from God to the people and then to the government instead of from God to a king and then the king doled out whatever rights and powers the king felt was necessary. So we really changed that understanding and that flow, if you will, of political power. So then we get to the four self-evident truths and we have to ask ourselves first, well, what's a self-evident truth? What does that mean? Anybody have any idea what a self-evident truth is? Can be challenged. Well, it can be challenged, but it'd be fruitless. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Obvi well, maybe. Obvious to some, not to others. Perhaps established. Established? Well, let's, let's, let's look at it from a mathematical standpoint real quick. Now, you're going to find out real quick why I went into political science and not math. But let's say we do this. What do you think that means? What's that, what's that in geometry? The straightest distance between two points is a straight line. That's a self-evident truth in math. I don't need anything else to explain that. Everything that you need to understand that is there. No proof. Okay? You can say the same thing about two parallel lines. Never what? Never intersect. Same thing. There's others, but you get the point. If you put that self-evident truth definition into English, you can simply say it's a statement where the evidence of that truth is contained within the statement itself. Okay? The evidence of that truth is contained within the statement of itself. So let's take a look at the first one. That all men are created equal. Hmm. Okay. They didn't put an eraser on it. Um, <clears throat> let's do this. What's the most What's the most important word in that statement? You're not going to believe me when I tell you this. Man. You know why? You know why? Because it's a collective noun. It means everyone, men and women, everyone, everywhere, for all time. 
Okay? Everyone, everywhere, for all time. Um, <clears throat> and that... Now, some people try to claim, as they did in the time of slavery before the Civil War, that this phrase, and even Stephen Douglas, ever heard of him, pretty famous <laughs> senator from the state of Illinois, even said, well, they're only talking about the rights of Englishmen. <laughs> okay? Lincoln came along, especially in his debates with Douglas, and said, no, that's not what this means. And Jefferson confirms that, by the way, too, in some letters. That men here means everyone, everywhere, for all time. What's the next most important word? Well, I would say created. created yeah. And the reason I would say that is this. What does it mean to create? Do man, does man create anything? Uh -uh. <laughs> to create means to make something out of nothing. All right? Man can't do that. So that implies a higher power. All right? It implies a higher power, just like we talked about when we talked about the laws of nature and nature's God. <coughs> So to create here, as I say, implies a higher power. It means that man is not totally, by any means, himself. So then the next most important word is probably equal. All right. And what does equality mean here? Does equality mean that everyone has the same intelligence, the same social capacity, the same color, the same whatever? No. It means that we are equal in our inalienable rights, our political rights. Okay? That's what equality means here. And this applies, as I say, to everyone, everywhere, for all time. Now, <clears throat> the first self-evident truth is first for a reason. Without it, the other three don't make a whole lot of sense. Okay? If men aren't equal, then we've got a problem. And this phrase, all men are created equal, gives us, in a sense, a yardstick to look at the justness, if you will, of not only our country, but others as well. That doesn't mean we're going to run around the world correcting everything, but it gives us a yardstick by which we can look at the legitimacy of governments. Is government doing what it's supposed to do? Does it recognize that equality? And we can certainly think of plenty of places that don't, right? <clears throat> the second self-evident truth is that these men who are all equal in their political rights, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What does it mean to be endowed with something? Well, particularly we're talking about from a creator, from God, that these things are part of us, that the, the, that's part of our nature, all right? So, we are endowed by, they are endowed by their creator, notice the word creator there, we don't create ourselves, we are beholden to a higher power, and ultimately that higher power has dominion over us. With certain unalienable rights, now here's an interesting word, unalienable, what does that mean? Any guesses? Let's take a look at the root of the word. Alien. What does it mean to alienate something? Separate. To take it away? Maybe. To take it away, possibly. Okay. Okay. Possibly. Okay. Separate. Separate. All right. All, all in the right direction. Now, somebody mentioned before one of the four tenets of the Tea Party was a belief or pursuit of limited government, mm -hmm. right? What does that mean, to be limited? We can, we, I mean, we can think of it in terms of limited, in terms of taxation and those kind of things. What does it mean in terms of limiting or being limited in terms of inalienable rights? Well, an inalienable right is one that cannot be taken away, right? We just said this. An inalienable right cannot be taken away or... Here's the other side of that coin. It cannot be 
consented away. I, as a human being, cannot consent away that which was not created by me or endowed in me because the Creator did that. I can't consent it away. Now you're thinking, well, wait a minute. You know, it happens all the time. Governments kill people. Yes, they do. But they can't destroy the right. The right still exists. That may seem like a bit of a moral victory, but, it, it, but it's true nonetheless. So an inalienable right can be alienated by either taking it away or consenting it away. Now this has profound political consequences. And let me see if I can point this out. This might seem a little extreme. But let's say <coughs> that we're unlimited. See, government is, cannot be unlimited, but neither can we be. If governments come about from our consent to form government and consenting up most of those natural rights to government, if we have the ability or the right to consent away even our life, our liberty, or our pursuit of happiness, and government gets its power from us, that means if we can consent away those things, then government's power can be unlimited. Think about it this way. I'm the government. I'm a tyrant. And I take this half of the room out, and I kill all of you. Sorry. Okay? The other half comes to me and says, why did you do that? And I say, because they told me I could. And they're not there to deny that, are they? Or to say that that's not correct. So we have to understand that inalienable rights are a check on the power, not only on the power of government, but on our power as well. Because if our power is unlimited, then government's power can be unlimited too. Think about that in terms of things like right to die laws. Okay? Um, we better be real careful before we go down that path. Real careful. Um, <clears throat> so something that's an inalienable cannot be taken away or consented away. All right? And the three, at this point, natural rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, even though we gave up most of those natural rights coming from a state of nature, we cannot give those up. Those are ours. Government cannot take those, unless under certain circumstances. What happens when you commit a crime? Well, we like, what we say is we don't consent away those inalienable rights, but through our actions, right, we put those rights in jeopardy. If you commit a crime, certainly government, that third party arbiter now that we gave all that power to, can send you to jail, <clears throat> take away your liberty. And just, chances are if they take away your liberty, your pursuit of happiness is gone too. Mm -hmm. And under certain circumstances, it can also take your life. So what we say here is, well, we can't consent away our right to life, liberty, or pursuit of happiness. We can forfeit that right, either temporarily or permanently, through our actions. All right? Now, notice <coughs> that the right to life, that these inalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, are listed in a ranked order. In other words, the most important is first, and it goes downhill from there, so to speak. Well, not downhill, but just lesser rank. <coughs> if you take away a life, you don't have liberty to pursuit of happiness, right? If you take away liberty, you may have life, but probably not pursuit of happiness. And you can't alienate one of the, you can't <coughs> pursue liberty or pursuit of happiness to the point that it takes away your life or somebody else's. So life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness here are presented in a ranked order of importance. If you don't have these, you got a problem. <clears throat> that speaks to a rather big issue that's been alive, unfortunately, in our country for a number of years. Right? I know the Tea Party doesn't get into the issues, but since I'm not a member, I'll say something. And that is, regardless of what the Supreme Court says in Roe v. Wade, they're wrong. <laughs> they're wrong. Okay. 
Um, because life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are there. And if you don't have those, if we don't do everything, if government doesn't secure those, we've got a real problem. Okay, speaking of securing things, <coughs> the next self-evident truth, you notice in that handout that I kind of moved the declaration around a little bit. I didn't take any words out, but I just numbered the four self-evident truths, so it's a little easier to follow. The third self-evident truth is that to secure these rights, and the rights that he's talking about here are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, and that is the purpose of government. Remember we said that the Declaration of Independence lays out what government's supposed to do, and the Constitution is the framework through which we try to achieve those goals. Well, right there, the Declaration is telling us what government should do. The purpose of government is to, se is to secure those rights. Does it do it every time? No. Does it do it perfectly? No. Does it do it more often than not? Yes. 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 <laughs> but we can argue that. We can argue that later. At any rate, that's the purpose of government, to secure those rights. Now, <clears throat> so it says to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Consent here, as I said, has nothing to do with voting. It has to do with consenting to leave a state of nature, as we talked about, and form civil society. And then, Jefferson says, the fourth self-evident truth, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them <coughs> shall seem most likely to affect the safety and their safety and happiness. That whole thing is the four self-evident truth, otherwise known in shorthand, so to speak, as a right to revolution. Not a right to secede, a right to revolution. When do you have that right to, rev to revolution? When government is not securing those rights more often than not. That's, that's a hard gauge. That's a hard gauge. But nonetheless, as I mentioned before, we can look at the Declaration and we can see a yardstick, so to speak, to measure the justness of, of regimes. And I use regimes here not in a negative connotation, but just meaning form of government. <clears throat> so we have that right, but Jefferson goes on to say shortly thereafter, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience Experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while well, evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. So what he's saying is, yeah, you have the right to revolution, but be careful. Be careful. Because what happens more often than not? Most revolutions end up, you end up with something worse, rather than something better. We are an exception. And there's a few others, but not many. If you think of the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, uh, and a number of others, ended up far off or far worse. So he's saying, be careful. You have the right to revolt, but it's, you may be better off suffering those evils while they're sufferable to put yourself in a worse situation, which is another thing to think about in terms of foreign policy. Because sometimes the choice is not between good and bad. In fact, most of the time it's not between good and bad. It's between better, or it's between bad and worse. And oftentimes we try to keep situations from getting worse. And we don't always have the option to try and make them better. All right. That's kind of the heart, if you will, of the Declaration of Independence. It lays out the meat, so to speak, if you will, of what's there in terms of rights, what government is supposed to do, what those rights are. Um, I didn't mention pursuit of happiness. Kind of a vague term. If you look at Locke's second treatise on government <coughs> in his chapter on property, Locke talks about life, liberty, and property. But it's hard to define, I mean, in terms of, well, we can't guarantee or secure everyone's property. But what we can try and do is secure our right to happiness, which may result in acquiring property, may result in other things. Um, so it's kind of a broad definition. What it doesn't mean is that you have the right to do anything you want. 
has to be within the bounds of good reason and within the law. And, and you, you know, you don't have a right to be a serial killer or something, even though that may make you happy, as an extreme example, okay? But it has to be within the bounds, to some extent, of, of reason and, and comport, if you will, with, with, uh, with the propriety, so to speak, of, of law and society. I was going to mention, <coughs> back there when we talked about leaving a state of nature and forming civil society, that's what it means to be civilized, all right? To form civil society and, and understand these rights, more often than not, uh, means to have a civilized society. Um, it's, it's interesting that uh, many times, you know, people have this idea that, well, you know, we can do whatever we want. No. This is a limited rights theory. Uh, sometimes we hear the libertarian kind of, of uh, from, J from John Mill talking about, well, he's the greatest good for the greatest number, or we have the opportunity, or we can do whatever we want to the extent that it doesn't bother anybody else or hurt anybody else. That's not the rights teaching upon which this country was formed. This is a limited rights theory. And it's really important, I think, that we understand that and try to re-educate ourselves about that. Um, I find, as I say in class, when I have students come in, in fact, my first class for this semester is tomorrow night, is that unfortunately our, our students are woefully uh, ignorant on a lot of these things, and it's not necessarily their fault. Um, but we need to re-educate and we need to get people to understand these things. It's, it's vitally important. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things that you will not see in the Declaration of Independence. One is what I call the great unanswered question. Nowhere in the Declaration of Independence does it say what form of government we must have. It doesn't say anything about it. Okay? It's at least theoretically possible that you could have a govern government that wasn't a democracy or a republic. You could conceive of at least theoretically have a government that was, that was run by maybe a few people, but if they were just and they secured those rights, it could be a legitimate form of government. Now, that almost never happens, okay? I think it was Churchill who once said, probably the worst form of government we have is democracy, but we haven't been able to find one better. And there's something to that. There's something to that. Now the other, that's kind of the great unanswered question. It doesn't say what form of government, but it was understood at the time of the founding that we certainly were going to have nothing other than a republic and a, and a popular form of government. That's out of all the disagreements that took place both at the, at the uh, Continental Congress and debating the Declaration and at the Constitutional Convention, that was not an argument. The understanding was that we're going to have some popular form of government. Now the great, what I like to call contradiction, as you might guess, was the issue of slavery. Here's Jefferson, the guy who wrote the Declaration of Independence, who owned slaves, talking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And a lot of people over these years have said, well, you know, that's hypocrisy. You can make a case for that. That's hypocrisy. But Jefferson once said, <clears throat> the institution of slavery is like holding a wolf by the ears. What happens if you let go? Probably going to get hurt. Right? And Lincoln said in his 1854 Peoria speech, laid out oh, in the last third of the speech, all of the things that the founders did to try and hem slavery in, because they knew that they couldn't eliminate it at the time of the founding. Well, people said, well, why didn't they, why didn't they just put in the Declaration and get rid of it? Well, let me read you a little something. This is Jefferson's rough draft, what he wrote before it went to the Continental Congress and got changed considerably. And if you go beyond the part where I've given you and look at the rest of the Declaration, it's something that's, he lists the grievances against the king. And in those grievances, he lists those in an ascending order of importance. In other words, the least important first and the most important thing last. Here's what he had for the most important thing in his original draft. Talking about the king. He says, he has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred right of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people 
who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. And he says more. But Jefferson understood, even though he owned slaves, he understood it was wrong. I'm not making excuses for him. I'm just laying out the contradiction. All right. Now, <clears throat> what would happen had the uh, anti-slavery people of the Continental uh, Congress decided to fight to leave this in? The Southern delegates, the slaveholding states, well, they're all slaveholding at that time. They could be. But the Southern states would have walked and would have said, we're not going to go along with this. And what did we say that the subtitle of the Declaration of the Independence was? The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America? There would not have been unanimity. What, what would have been the odds or the chances, as I say, of success? Probably next to none. The founders went on, and they understood, as Lincoln said, that they put this phrase, all men are created equal, in the Declaration of Independence for what? Did they need that in there to declare independence from Britain? No. They put it in there not for use at that time, but for some future use. And that came along in the Civil War and the elimination of slavery. So the founders understood, and if you look at the Constitution, the Constitution never says the word slave or slavery. It talks about persons held to service and so forth. Remember here last week when the <coughs> Congress read the Constitution? They decided to leave out for reasons I understand, but I wish they wouldn't have the three-fifths compromise about slaves being, quote-unquote, worth three-fifths of a person. That's not what that clause is about, by the way. It's about voting power in Congress. That's another story, okay? That's another story. But it's about voting power in Congress. It was never about the worth or the humanity of slaves. So the founders understood that slavery was wrong, and they hoped that they could at least put it on the road to extinction. You have to remember, slavery existed on this continent for 175 years, and was entwined as an institution in this country before we even declared independence. So it wasn't going to be done away with easily. We fought a very, very bloody civil war as a result. Um, let me close with a quick something here. <clears throat> this is a, a short speech that Lincoln gave at Independence Hall on his way to assume the presidency. He took a train, and he stopped a number of places. But one of the places he stopped was in Philadelphia. And they asked him kind of extemporaneously to say a few words. And here's what he said. He said, I am filled with deep emotion at finding myself standing in this place where were collected together the wisdom, the patriotism, the devotion to principle from which sprang the institutions under which we live. You have kindly suggested to me that in my hands is the task of restoring peace to our distracted country. I can say... I can say, um, let's see here. I can say, so far as I have been able to draw them from the sentiments which originated here and were given to the world from this hall, I have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. I have often pondered over the dangers which were incurred by the men who assembled here and framed and adopted that Declaration. I have pondered over the toils that were endured by the officers and soldiers of the army who achieved that independence. I have often inquired of, of myself what great principle or idea it was that kept this confederacy, meaning at that time the Union, so long together. It was not the mere matter of a separation of the colonies from the motherland, but that sentiment in the Declaration of Independence, which gave liberty not alone to the people of this country, but hope to all the world, for all future. It was that which gave promise that in due time the weights would be lifted from the shoulders of all men, and that all should have an equal chance. 
This is the sentiment embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Now, my friends, can this country be saved on that basis? If it can, I will consider myself one of the happiest men in the world if I can help to save it. If this country cannot be saved without giving up that principle I was about to say, I would rather be assassinated on this spot than surrender it. Now, in my view, the present aspect of affairs, there is no need of bloodshed and war. There is no necessity for it. I am in favor of such a course. I am not in favor of such a course, and I may say in advance that there will be no bloodshed unless it is forced upon the government. The government will not use force unless force is used against it. My friends, this is a holy and unprepared speech. I did not expect to be called on to say a word when I came here. I suppose that I was merely to do something about raising a flag. I may therefore have said something in the street, but I have said nothing but what I am willing to live by, and if by the pleasure of Almighty God to die by. And he did. Questions? Certainly right up towards the top, if it's not the greatest. Um, it's interesting if you look at Federalist 78. Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton was one of the three of the authors of the Federalist Papers mentions that he thinks that the judicial branch will be the least dangerous government, <laughs> least dangerous part of government. I would wish I wish he were on that. Uh, Hamilton was right about a lot of things, but he was wrong about that. Mm. Um, and that's why it's, as I said before, that's why it's, I can't emphasize the importance of groups and people like this being involved in the, in the political realm, um, even, frankly, if at times you're disgusted by it, and I understand <laughs> that. But nonetheless, because the people that get elected to office, I mean, that, we can't do a more important thing. Look at what's happened, as I say, you know, with, with the uh, appointments to the Supreme Court. I mean, they are remarkably important. There's no question about that. They are remarkably important. And unfortunately, the courts, particularly in the 20th century, have assumed unto themselves the power of judicial review, which means they can declare laws unconstitutional. That's nowhere in the Constitution. Okay? It comes from uh, a court case primarily called Marbury versus Madison. Um, now, judicial review was something that was very prevalent and around at the time of the founding in state constitutions or the time of the, con uh, the Constitutional Convention. But it was never put in the federal uh, Constitution. Um, so we have to, uh, yeah, I mean, those things, not only the Supreme Court justices, but the whole tier, tier of federal courts, the appellate courts, the district courts, those are remarkably important. Um, and that's why it's <coughs> crucial that we work to get people, you know, if you can't get the presidents, that you need to, we need to have senators, for example, who are willing to stand up and fight in confirmation hearings for the right people. Um, when you look... You know, unfortunately, another thing has taken hold in this country, and that's the idea of judicial supremacy. In other words, that once the Supreme Court decides that's the law of the land, the question is answered. That's nonsense. Now, we have to obey that when that decision comes down, but that doesn't mean that we can't work to change it, work to get people in there who will reverse bad decisions. Okay? Do you comment in regards to what you just said at the Supreme Court for itself decision regarding the legislative branch and executive branch that this was in relation to the uh, first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence? <coughs> Since um, what I'm referring to is where it says the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature is God. Um, <coughs> if, I'm under, if I'm understanding you correctly, you think you're talking about in terms of things like separation of church and state and so forth? Or no, just, just what parameter laws are to be understood uh, as to where they're derived from? Well... In other words, if I make a law that says anybody could go out and kill everybody else in the pursuit of liberty and happiness, and somebody else wants a law that says no, you cannot go out and kill anybody you want to. Uh, and so you have two laws that uh, are well, the Supreme to each other. Well, the Supreme Court's certainly been put in the position of being the arbiter in, in, in those situations. How they're going to decide depends on the makeup of the court to some extent, uh, to a large extent. Um, 
if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, I'd love to see the Supreme Court not necessarily cite the Declaration of Independence as a as a particular legal source, but understand it and take some guidance from it would be nice. Mm -hmm. That that would be that would be uh, real nice. Uh, there are a few justices that do, um, but unfortunately, many of them don't. Anything else? What would you have to say to the um, common uh, complaint or, or comment that the uh, Constitution is a living document? <laughs> I would say that's horrendous. <laughs> And the reason and I would, yeah, and the, and the reason I would say that is simply this: if you're going to make the argument, unfortunately, as many do, that the Constitution is a quote-unquote living document, then frankly, anything goes, mm -hmm. right? We have an amendment process. Let's use it, all right? If that's the case, um, if, if if the Constitution is a living document, then it really then it really plays into what we're talking about with judicial supremacy, then. And it really falls into line with the idea where, uh, I forgot <coughs> what Justice said, it maybe it was, um, <sighs> forgot. Anyway, said, the, the law is what the Supreme Court says it is. That's living Constitution stuff. Yes. Okay? The idea that somehow the Constitution changes, quote unquote, with the times. Um, does it have to be interpreted sometimes? Yes. Are there circumstances that come up that may not have existed at the time of the founding? Yes. But the original intent or construction should be there as a guide. Um, and if we're really going to change something, and I said, then it should come through the amendment process, where there's broad debate about it. Um, if you look at the amending process in the Constitution, Article 5, it's difficult to get a constitutional amendment through, and rightly so, because there should be a broad consensus about changing something in the Constitution. Uh, I appreciate your comments on That's not an easy task, to say the least. Um, we've had, you know, we've had a good hundred years or more of breaking those things down. Um, I would suggest. Has anybody ever heard of a book called Liberal Fascism? Yes. Yeah. I highly recommend it. There's a couple of little flaws in it too, but it's it's very good. It gives you a very good history and overview of the progressive movement, particularly starting in a sense with with uh, Woodrow Wilson. Um, and what you see, let me go back to what your uh, question was, and that is this. It's not an easy task to turn a society around. I have some, I have some um, rays of hope, <laughs> okay? Um, I know people in, in academia who are good conservatives who teach these things, and there's more of those people on the way, okay? Unfortunately, we've been dominated for the last 20, 30 years from the people that came out of the 60s, unfortunately, um, and, and, and fallen into the traps of, of what social sciences have taught us about there's no right and there's no wrong and relativism and all those kinds of things. But there are people out there who are doing good work and who are starting, I hope, to turn some of those things around. Can it be done quickly enough? I don't know. We'll see. All right? Um, but it begins here, too. That's why, as I mentioned when I started tonight, Thank you for being here, for taking this interest, because it's, it's that which is going to make the difference in the long run. As far as education is concerned, I hesitate to say this, um, but as we well know, there are problems in the public schools. As Dave mentioned before, you know, the kind of people we get on the school boards and, and are, are, is vitally important. Um, it'd be easy to wash our hands and send our kids to religious schools or private schools. And frankly, I honestly would say if you have children and you can afford to do that, do that, okay? Um, if you have good homeschool groups, um, 
do that. Um, but if your children do go to the public school or have, keep a very close eye on the things that they're being taught. Try to correct those things that you see uh, that are misleading them. They don't need to go back and beat their head against the wall at school, but they need to grow up understanding that maybe some of the things that they learned weren't right. All right? Um, that's a long-term project. In terms of turning things around politically, there's no magic bullet. I'm sorry, I wish there was. There's no magic solution. We are not going to, um, I don't know, get Obama's birth certificate and get him out of office. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. Okay? Maybe it should, but it's not going to happen. There's no magic bullet. And the thing that has to be done is to keep plugging away. Keep teaching the right things. Keep working for good people, for good candidates, to get them into office. All right? Um, I, somebody said here not long ago that the real trick is not simply to get good people in office because we know that that's not always going to happen. All right? In Federalist 10, Madison says, enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. <laughs> all right? And he's right. In fact, he might even say, not en enough of the time, let alone ever. All right? But the point is, is to work for good people. And the other thing to do is, through organizations like this, is to influence the people who don't want to vote the right way to vote the right way. And you do that through calling them up and writing them letters and, and not let them get away with stuff. And that's the best solution I can give you. It's not going to happen quick. It's going to be very slow. And, and, and the enthusiasm that came with this election, with the Tea Party and others, is going to be tough to maintain. It always is. It's easy to get excited about something for the moment. It's tough to keep it going. All right? And that's not an easy task, but we need to be done. What happens in 2012 with the presidential election, with Senate, in Senate elections and others, is going to be remarkably important. If we, do, if we don't get, frankly, another president, this health care system may be, in many ways, locked in. And that's going to be tough to get rid of and do one heck of a lot of damage. Um, so what, now, do I think President Obama is going to be reelected? I don't know. He's the incumbent president. He has a heck of an advantage. Okay? And we shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate him. Anything else? Just, just one thing. Yes. John, I would just say, I, I had an aha moment, and every time I hear this, it's an aha moment. I've had the honor to give the oath of office to military members, mm -hmm. and, and I also had the honor to give my son the oath of office when he graduated from the Air Force oh, Academy. Great. But when I hear some remind, uh, you know, the public is reminded by a government official that we give the oath or affirmation of office to the Constitution right. and not to the form of government. That always kind of, it's the cold water, that's right. Every time it goes back to the concepts that are embodied sure, in the sure. declaration. And, you know, look at the presidential oath, look at the oath for in terms of, of, terms of uh, Senate and House members. It's always to uphold the Constitution of the United States. Period. You know, that's, now look, there could be plenty of argument about what the Constitution means and what it says. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's room for disagreement on that. I think it's gotten carried away in some ways, obviously. But nonetheless, we can argue about that. But, but that's where the allegiance lies. Because if, you know, if we get into this living constitution nonsense and we go down that road, it's going to be, it's going to be turned into you know, nothing more than a parchment barrier and ink on paper. It's not going to have any force. Okay? Is there any more questions, folks?